Hi everybody, I'm Katie Strand and I am here with the final chapter of Bless This Mess, I'm giving you a brief, uh, hopefully brief, summary and just pulling out a few of the nuggets from this last chapter that I um, really have appreciated. So um, here we go, chapter 10, worry, worry once and worry well, talking about brave parenting. Um, and a few key ideas as I went through this chapter that I will pull out for you. Um, one is a theology of worry. Um, so differentiating between worry and prayer. So worry says, I am the master of my own universe, but I recognize my power or skills are too limited to ensure the outcome I hope for. Prayer says, I'm not in charge. In fact, I surrender to the outcome. Things may take a painful turn, but I'm not alone because I know God is here with me, sending allies and angels who will strengthen me. Um, and they say, uh, or they, they refer to the phrase or the saying that courage is fear that has said its prayers. Um, so really worry, worry has to do with us wanting to feel like we're in control of things that we are not in control of. And um, prayer is acknowledging that we don't have all of the control that we maybe wish we did. Um, but there are um, some follow-up thoughts with this that I think are really helpful. One is, again, with this idea of control, um, that parent love, that there's this holy parent love that is in scriptures, it talks about perfect love driving out all fear. And so that's the kind of love that um, is perfect, right? Um, our love is not always perfect for our kids. So they talk about this fine line between this holy parent love and love that is grasping or controlling or um, that is more fear-based. And we can easily kind of move into that. So they try to um, get in, in a little bit later in the chapter, get into some of the more practical ways to understand um, worrying well, because I think we all do it. And some of us are probably better at worrying than others or better at letting things go. Um, so they um, talk about, you know, if we protect our kids, if we try to control everything around our kids and protect them from adversity, what we actually are doing is failing to let them develop the tools they need for a lifetime of adversity. Um, we can guarantee they are going to see hardship and challenge, loss, pain. Um, we cannot prevent that for our kids' whole lives. So to prevent that when they're children all the way through is not um, in the end going to be helpful for them at all. The statement that I thought was really important to say in here is, they say, the God we believe in does not send adversity or tragedy, but she will take advantage of the crisis in progress for her own holy purposes. Um, so this, you know, is kind of a cliche or maybe an understanding that God sends things to test people or to, um, you know, that all things happen for a reason or God doesn't give us more than we can handle. Um and they kind of push back against that a little bit and say that um, we don't necessarily believe God sends all of this on purpose, um, but that God uses it for good to draw us closer to each other, to God, um, to, uh, you know, uses tragedy to teach us things or to even bring comfort in new ways. Um, then they talk about getting into some key things about worrying well. And I thought that a few of these statements were also helpful. So they bring up um, what Jesus says in the scriptures, his advice on worry to don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And that one way to understand that would be to say, let's just worry about what we have in front of us and not what is somewhere down the road in the future, tomorrow. Um, but worry focus, help your worry to focus on what you know instead of what you do not know yet. Um, and <clears throat> also never worry alone. So um, prayer is like worrying with God because we're sharing our worries with God. Um, but also 
share those worries with a friend, with um, family, with a therapist, with members of your community at church. Um, know that you are not worrying alone and that that will release the burden. I'm sure we've you have all experienced that when you share um, you know, a struggle that you're having or a worry that you're experiencing. If you say it out loud to someone else, oftentimes um, it lifts the burden of that quite a bit. Um, a, you know, you often find out you're not alone, that you share that same worry or that same struggle with someone else, but also just sharing, um, just sharing your story can really help that, um, that burden be lifted. Um, and then it talks about acceptance as being a tool to help you worry well, um, defined as an acceptance defined as an act of surrender of giving over those things we can't change so we can shift our focus onto those that we can. If you think about the serenity prayer, um, the part of it reads, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, so acceptance is a part of healthy worry to realize there are certain things that we, um, that we cannot change. And <clears throat> um, so those are kind of some framework ideas helpful to approach worry. Then they moved into um, some really specific stories um, from families who have different um, challenges, different struggles, different worries within their own family. Um, and these were excellent stories. And like any, any personal story, it's so hard. Like I can't really summarize it to do it justice. But I did find, again, some really wise and helpful words for me in here that I'm going to pull out. So one, this first one is about um, having a child who is dealing with substance abuse and addiction and the path to recovery. Um, and here was an insight this person shared that um, regarding their own faith journey through this, that um, they heard one said in al on meeting that God doesn't have any grandchildren. This is a clever way of saying that we are all children of God. My child is not God's grandchild. I am not the conduit through which my son or daughter is connected to God. My son or daughter is God's child, just as I am God's child. And so just this helpful like sense of we place our children into God's hands, not, be, you know, and God doesn't hold our children with love because we love them, but because God loves them. And I find that comforting. I don't know. I hope some of you do too. Um, then the next story is by um, someone whose children deal with depression, depression, anxiety, um, cutting, um, and some other um, kind, kind of mental health complications. And as part of them telling this story, um, telling their story and then also telling um, sharing a bunch of statistics about the high prevalence of some kind of mental health struggle in children and teenagers and young adults. And they say, I'm telling you so my twins don't feel so alone. I'm telling you so you don't feel so alone. And I'm telling you so I don't feel so alone. So the power of telling our story is so great for ourselves and our kids and each other. Um, that there's power in sharing, uh, sharing these stories and knowing that we are not alone. Um, then there's a uh, Tom's story, which is about uh, queer kids and their own child coming out as transgender. And there were a couple of cool things in this. So one of the, one of Tom's the dad's statements was amazingly, alongside moments of worry, doubt, and confusion, there were also incredible moments of grace. Um, and I think about a lot of those, a lot of our life experiences when, when we're in the middle of it, it can be really hard to see beyond the confusion, the doubt, the, um, grief, whatever, but uh, like God is there and those, um, little flashes of God's grace also show up. And, um, so I think by, you know, paying attention, watching for those, realizing that God's um, God's working through all of that. Uh, we might we might notice those um, gifts of grace even in the midst of really challenging times. And they too start talk about how they combat combat their fears about 
fears for their child um, who is transgender by speaking out, telling their story, fighting for the rights of every person to live a full life as their true self. So again, telling your story has power. Then there's a story of someone with a child on the autism spectrum, very severe autism, nonverbal, um, and also uh, a form of epilepsy that's really serious and just a really challenging situation. Um, but she highlights the importance of her community and being part, both part of a church community where um, some of her fears as a parent are what's going to happen when I'm gone, who's going to take care of my child, and whether you have a child with special needs or not, I think that's a fear that we can understand. Um, I mean, obviously, we hope that our children can grow up to become independent, but that's not always the case for a variety of reasons. But um, she talked about how it's a comfort to be part of a community of faith where she sees that other people love her child um, with the kind of love that like, she can trust that there are people who will always love her child, even if she is, herself is not there love and care for her child. Um, and then also finding community with other people who ki whose, kids, whose kids have special needs and um, they advocate for one another's children and they support each other in that way. So the importance of community to help us deal with our worries. Um, then, so that, then the section about stories, individual stories kind of wraps up and um, moves into talking about how we help our kids to worry well. Um, because our kids worry too. And um, this I thought, I'm going to read it word for word because I think it's great, but um, it's kind of a summary of the most important thing your child needs to hear from you through your words, your actions, or both. And here it is. Um, here's what we want our kids to, to know from us. God doesn't make any junk. Of everything God made in the creation story, God said this and only this. It's good. It's real good. That includes you. You are not broken. You are not bad. You are not a burden. You are beautiful through and through and made in the image of God. I love you so much and my life would be different and worse if you were not in it. God didn't make this happen to you, this diagnosis, this illness, disability, burden, whatever it might be. So God didn't make this happen to you. But God has used and will use this challenge to bring all kinds of awareness and gifts and goodness into your life, into our family's life, and into the lives of many people that your life bumps up against. So um, that may be a helpful paragraph, a helpful thing for you to just internalize too. Um, I think we all need to we all need to know this deep down inside. But God doesn't make any junk, and God is God is with us in the midst of our challenges. Here are some other specific things that we can keep in mind with regard to our kids who might be worrying about something. Um, so the first is, the worst thing anyone can do when facing something anxiety provoking is to avoid it. Um, so if your kid is worried about something, don't like throw them into the deep end with, you know, to face that fear, help them gradually scaffold into a more comfortable, com a higher comfort level, but also don't, don't ignore it and don't give them a total pass. Um, I mean, we don't want to avoid the situation um, that is causing anxiety. Um, when you have something scary or anxiety provoking to tell your child at any age, don't hide it, at least not for too long. Um, recognizing that our kids deserve um, to know the truth at the, at the age appropriate level and at the pace that is appropriate for them. Um, so, they, you know, they sense if there's something going on and you're trying to keep it from them. So don't, don't try to hide it. Um, number three, this is related to number two. Remember that your child's perspective is uniquely hers. Don't dismiss worries as silly because from her point of view, they aren't. Um, so just recognizing that everybody has, you know, whether it's because of your developmental stage, your temperament, um, other things with your personality, whatever, um, that, um, the worries that our kids have are valid, um, no matter what they are. And um, they might be, you might be surprised at the things that they're worried at and not worried about, things that we would assume that they are. Um, for example, here, someone talked about hiding a, a parent's cancer diagnosis from their kids for a while. And finally, when they share it, the kids are actually really relieved because they knew their parents were hiding something from them. 
But they said, like, the reaction was something like, oh, thank God, I thought you were going to tell us you guys were getting divorced, or I thought you were going to tell us that we were having to move, or, you know, the, the things that they were afraid of um, were not what the parents were worried about. Um, it was something else. So, so the benefit of be, having openness and um, telling the truth to your kids. Uh, number four, consider, too, how your child's worries and reactions to worrying news will be shaped by their age and stage of development and their temperament. Um, so just be being um, kind of prepared for that, you know, that you may be surprised and you also may be able to predict a little bit of their reaction based on how old they are or what kind of kid they are. A conversation about a big worry is never a one and done. This reminds me of the, the sex talk we talked about before where um, you don't want one big talk. It needs to be kind of an ongoing conversation. There may be one initial conversation, but there needs to be lots of follow-up about a worry. It needs to be an open, um, an open dialogue because um, acceptance is something that, you know, if you're aiming for a, a level of acceptance, that's not something that you just snap your fingers and have. It's a process. To get there, it might involve a lot of questions, um, a lot of expressing of feelings and different things like that. So, um, yes. Then, let's see. Then there's a section on self-care, talking about um, this is this is where worry and uh, parenting. You know, like when we don't take care of ourselves, when we don't um, figure out how to deal with our own worry in a healthy way, it does trickle out into the rest of our family. I know we experienced this with the last year of living in a pandemic that our kids absolutely picked up on all of the emotions that Nate and I were carrying around with us. And even though like we didn't talk about everything in front of them um, at different times, you know, different stages and phases of this last year, we were very worried and um, anxious. And they, you know, especially looking back on it in hindsight, I can see their behavior reflected that they were picking up on our anxiety, whether we shared it with them or not. So anyway, finding healthy ways to deal with it. So um, here's a few just quick um, things to practice as worrying parents. So step back, calm down, and say a prayer. Try an open-ended one like this. God, I have no idea what to do next, but you do. Um, slow your breathing down. If you're really anxious, try the four, five, eight breath. We referred to that in an earlier chapter. That's breathing in for a count of four, holding for a count of five, and breathing out for a count of eight. This is a great practice for parents and kids. Physiologically, it affects the, that kind of breathing, helps to calm down our anxious, worried brains. Um, getting quiet to hear enough to hear what God has to say. Um, getting quiet to listen to God, maybe tuning out, that may, that may um, require you to tune out messages from Facebook, from, uh, from family, um, from culture, and be able to listen for God's voice. And it says, you know it's the right voice because it will calm you down. God's voice is there to bring us peace and to help us discern and guide us in a, a way of love, in a way of comfort for our you know, kids who are worried or going through difficult times. And it will ask you to suspend your fear and your pride and in, your, in its place, we'll offer you something much better, grace and peace that passes all understanding. Um, so with that, that is the close of the chapter. That is the end of the book. In the epilogue, they, in, they acknowledge that it ends kind of abruptly. Like there's not really a clear, you know, tied off with a bow because um, we're all still learning. We're all still growing, including the authors as they are um, continuing to live life with their own families and in their own journeys of faith. Um, but I do think it's a good message for us to hear at the end of this that, um, that God wants us to take care of ourselves and find space so that um, the things that tend to consume us and worry us the most um, whether, you know, that could refer to any of these chapters from throughout the book, um, but worry in general um, that God invites us into a place of quiet and calm and peace so that we can hear her voice. 
Um, and with that, I am going to close us with the final prayer that's in this book. Um, that's a great one for all of us to say with regard to anything that is really tough or worrisome or um, just throwing a wrench in our lives. So let's pray. God, I hate this thing that is happening right now. I'm scared and sad and lost in the dark, but you are light on my path leading me forward. Scripture says all things work together for good for those who love you. And I'm trying. Show me the blessing inside what's broken. Amen. Have a great day. Um, I hope that you can see the blessing inside whatever is broken in your life or in your family's life right now. And um, yeah, we'll be back uh, with some more updates in the coming weeks. Thanks. Blessings.